and welcome to space here from the decks of the Plymouth Quest research vessel. We're in the English Channel today seeing how satellites are being used together with measurements from the sea surface in order to better understand our oceans. But first let's have a look at some other news from the universe this month. The Curiosity rover has found evidence that salty water forms in the soil of Mars at night. However, the planet is still considered far too hostile for life to exist there now. Rosetta scientists say Philae found no evidence of a magnetic field on Comet 67P, a result which rules out one of the leading theories into planet formation. American space firm ULA has unveiled plans for its new Vulcan rocket. It will use American-built engines rather than the Russian ones used on previous launches. To our main story now. And the oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface, but how much do we really know about them? Plymouth, one of England's historic port cities, a place from which sailors, soldiers and scientists have set off to sea for centuries. Today is no different, as a team from Plymouth Marine Laboratory head to their regular monitoring station in the English Channel. Today we're going out, we're going to collect uh, the water samples, some, use our, some of our electronic sensors and, and really test the ecosystem, measure the water column and see what's going on at the station. Among those on board is Spanish scientist Victor Martinez Vicente, a specialist in combining data from satellites in space with data from the sea surface. Well, we collect the water samples from a particular depth and we transfer them into these uh, sample waters that we take to the lab. These samples are precious to oceanographers as they give crucial real-life information and then build up a bigger picture of how our oceans are evolving. It's a joined-up approach, so we use the in-situ sampling to, to get a true idea of what's going on in the environment, to measure the interactions between all the different parameters, chemical, physical and biological. We then bring them and we can relate them to what the satellite's seeing. Today's samples will be studied for colour, because it's that which tells the researchers about phytoplankton, microscopic algae that are the base of the ocean food chain, and produce half the oxygen on planet Earth. Victor's results will then be used to improve the accuracy of satellite data. So in this little vial you get the order of uh, thousands of small cells, phytoplankton, which do photosynthesis, as well as bacteria and other particles as well. And you can detect this using laboratory measurements that count each of the occurring cells in it. And one of the reasons why we are doing this is to uh, match uh, what the satellite sees with what there is in the water. Later this year, this satellite, ACES Sentinel-3, will join the fleet of Earth observers already in orbit. It's part of Europe's Copernicus program and heralds a new era in ocean observation by offering an uninterrupted flow of data from its speedy polar orbit. When you go across an ocean from North Pole to South Pole with a satellite, it takes 50 minutes and 50 minutes to complete the circle. Given that it does 14 orbits a day, you have global coverage in practically one day. You'd need almost a year to do that on a boat. We've long known that oceans dominate life on our planet and govern our weather and climate. But now, with the eyes of satellites, we can really get a planet-scale view of what is happening. From space, we measure physical parameters like temperature, salinity. We know how to measure mass by the variation in the gravity field. And we measure the height of the ocean, which includes several phenomena. And we also study color in visible light. A lot can be learned from space, but there's always a need to keep checking the data with readings from the open sea. Among the instruments on board the boat is a new device to automatically control glinting sunlight. This is an above water radiometer. It uh, looks at the ocean color directly as a satellite would, but in this case, the measure is taken right above the surface of the water. 
we measure that so that we are able to uh, give a better estimate a, a better validation of what the satellite is actually looking at that one parameter ocean color can reveal so much about our planet in particular it shows how the living ocean adapts to change phytoplankton that i mentioned they are microscopic they are dynamic uh, they are very active so you can think of them as the ocean analog of the canary in the coal mine. They will respond very, very rapidly to any change. The satellite revolution in oceanography means each parameter can be monitored, mapped and modelled on a global scale. So researchers can begin to look for trends and signs of interaction between ocean colour, sea level, surface height and temperature. Sea level has been increasing, not everywhere and not uniformly, uh, but overall the trend is an increasing trend. Ocean temperatures have been increasing, uh, surface temperatures, but not so much in the last couple of years. And the scientists are again uh, interested in why that is so. With so much more data now available from many different sources in the sea and in space, we're slowly but surely starting to get the measure of our oceans. We're in a period now where the information we're getting back from the oceans is so significant. We have the satellite remote sensing, we have observatories and in-situ monitoring, we have large autonomous systems out in the ocean all the time. We know far more than we ever have done because of technology and once we understand that we can, we can then start looking into the future to see how things might change, how the environment might adapt to a changing environment. Away from the oceans now and to our regular series, the Astronaut Academy. And Thomas Pesquet explains to us how you get fit for space. Hello, my name is André Rosenberger. I'm the um, fitness coach for Thomas. I'm feeling great. This is just a warm up. There are special muscles you have to work on. Um, especially the anti-gravity muscles. So for our strength training, for example, we, we focus on the leg muscles and on the back muscles. Do we have enough sweat? Yes. Yeah, is it dripping on the bike? We want to gain muscle or maintain, actually, muscle mass and bone mass. After six months in space, you lose some, some body mass, you lose some bone mass, uh, you lose some balance. So. You're not in a great shape when you come back, so if you start from here, then you might end up here. If you start from here, you're gonna end up way below. And that's the whole point of training for space. That's it for now. Next month, we see what's happening with the latest missions to Mars. See you then.